Alrighty, so hi everybody. It is two o'clock, so we're gonna get started. I know a few people are still coming in, but we can begin. So I am Fabi, I am the Workforce Coordinator at JAA, and today with us we have um, Port Everglades to celebrate National Maritime Day. So we'll be hearing from these panel of speakers, and we will have a video, and uh, we will go to a Q&A. So if you have any comments or questions throughout the process, just type them in the chat box. We'll be keeping an eye on that. And now I'm going to throw it to Ellen Kennedy, who will be our moderator from Port Everglades. Hi, Ellen. Hi. Thanks, Fabi. And welcome all these students from Junior Achievement. It's a great honor to have you today. We actually wanted to have you in person, as you can imagine. We um, thought that you could come uh, as a group and we could tour you around the, the port. You could see a cruise terminal and cranes and some exciting things that we have going on here. Um, but you know, because of coronavirus, here you are. And uh, here we are as well. <laughs> and so I'm gonna start um, telling you a little bit about Maritime Day, which is just that it was founded in 1933. So it's been going on for a long time. And almost everything in your life has something to do with international trade. The clothes you're wearing, the food you eat, uh, a lot of different things. Um, and so 90 to 95 percent of those come over by um, ocean carrier, by shipping. And so that's the importance of our port is everything you get, the bananas you eat for breakfast, the, the shoes that you're wearing, everything comes through international trade. And then maybe some of you have been on cruise vacations. And so you'll have been through the port, which is, is always nice. So let me show you a little video. It's going to tell you a little bit what's going on here. We have $1.6 billion in construction improvements that are being made here at the port to, for expansion because we are planning on growing. So enjoy the video. Port Everglades, a major economic driver for our local economy, is one of the leading gateways when it comes to international trade in our nation. With more than 7 million tons of cargo from 70 countries arriving and departing from the port each year, it's why Port Everglades is one of the busiest container ports in the United States. With its unique geographic location and modern infrastructure, these rankings are only expected to rise. And now Port Everglades is investing in our future with more than $1.5 billion invested in cutting edge infrastructure improvements this creates jobs and brings more business to our region. Here's a look at those projects and why they're essential for Florida. Expanding the turning notch for additional cargo berths, new, larger, super post Panamax gantry cranes, deeper and wider navigation channels, a modernized petroleum slip and a new parking garage for cruise passengers. These are just a few investments that Port Everglades is making to help its customers expand and succeed, keeping Florida's future bright. We've had progressive growth in both the container side of the business as well as the cruise side, and we project those to continue to grow. Florida is our nation's third most populous state, and with its projected future growth, the port is a lifeline for daily necessities. Food, automobiles, consumer goods arrive here, Ranked number one in Florida for perishables and number five in the United States, Port Everglades is a gateway for trade with Latin America. I think what's important for people to, to think about Port Everglades in terms of doing uh, business here is the ease of doing business with the port. Uh, the vision the port is having of being in forefront of developments and not the least the geographical location of the port in terms of uh, population density in Florida. A short entrance channel, connections to the nation's highways make the port a go-to choice. The strategic and technological improvements now underway will keep waterborne commerce flowing well into the future. The expansion of the South Port turning notch from 900 to 2400 feet and the addition of new high-tech support post Panamax gantry cranes will increase cargo throughout and the number of ships that the port can handle simultaneously. They're 20 feet taller, so they can uh, lift higher, and they can lift heavier containers, so it gives us a lot more capacity than we currently have. Also on the horizon is the Deep Water Project with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. A channel depth extending to essentially 50 feet will allow ships to arrive and depart with more containerized cargo capacity. In addition, a narrow section of the channel 
will be widened so cargo ships can pass cruise ships safely along the intercoastal waterway. The Turning Notch project will add about 730,000 uh, additional TEU capacity to the ports. When you factor in the dredging, you can add approximately 200,000 more additional TEU. So over the 20-year period, it's evident to be able to double its capacity in terms of containerized cargo volume. Well, the infrastructure that we're investing in, and more importantly, the infrastructure that our tenants are investing in, will lead to future, more efficient, more cargo throughput, and more jobs. Port Everglades has a very clear vision on where we want to go as a port community. Uh, that's based on the master plan. And the master plan uh, sets uh, forth uh, very clear goals and objectives, uh, and also a very well-structured capital allocation. I think the analysis on where to put your money is very important so that the port uh, really invests in uh, activities and infrastructure that it's gonna add value to our customers. Providing more than $34 billion of economic impact to Florida, the port's mission is to provide local, statewide, and national jobs. That's why Port Everglades, a self-funded enterprise, constantly monitors market conditions and continually updates its master plan. We import wines and spirits from across the entire globe, as far away as Australia, New Zealand, the Orient, Japan, all over Europe, the Mediterranean, South America. Having these containers come into the port and to be able to handle it efficiently is extremely important to us. And then on top of that, the great working relationship that the port has with U.S. Customs allows our containers to be received in and cleared on a timely basis. This is extremely important to us because it allows us to get product to the marketplace quickly, so it allows us to service our customers and for them to not be out of stock when that customer walks in and wants to buy that fine Bordeaux from France. 45,500 of the reds and then 5,000 of the blacks, which are hard to see. Equally important to the port's growth is a robust and innovative environmental stewardship program. We look at it, our investments that we make, we take into account the environmental impact and how we can mitigate for that impact. The port planted more than 16 acres of mangroves and other native vegetation that has been deeded to the state and is being managed by the South Florida Audubon Society. Corals growing in the area were relocated as part of the expansion efforts. The port will be watching and maintaining those corals over the next several years to make sure that they flourish. And the port took a leadership role, participating in a baseline air emission survey partnering with the EPA. It was the first study of, it, of its type in a port environment, and that study is actually being used now as sort of a base or a pilot for other ports to do a similar study. These infrastructure investments and additional cutting-edge technology will ensure Port Everglades remains a maritime industry favorite while providing for Florida's future economic needs. To allow cargo, to leave the port, to connect into other parts of the state is a huge advantage for any potential customer that would be thinking about coming to Port Everglades. So students, I hope you enjoyed that. I, I realized that I never introduced myself. My name is Ellen Kennedy. Bobby introduced me. And I am the Acting Director of Business Development, which um, oversees cruise and cargo business um, coming into the port as far as um, helping our customers grow their business and bringing in new customers. But my uh, greater hat is as spokesperson for the port and um, I head up communications. So that's why you have me as your host today. And one of the stars of our video right there was Glenn Wilshire and he is our um, port director. And he'll tell you a little bit about our port and what's going on and uh, we'll give you a sort of a broad overview, Glenn. Well, thanks, Alan, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. As Alan said, I'm Glenn Wiltshire. I'm the acting chief executive and uh, port director here at Port Everglades. A little bit about my background. How did I get here? Well, in 1971, which was a long time ago for all of you, uh, I had to decide what to do for my life. So actually, I applied to the Coast Guard Academy, uh, got an appointment, uh, spent four years there, spent 30 years after that in the Coast Guard as, as an officer. Uh, and then uh, in 2006, I came down to Port Everglades where I was uh, the deputy director for a little over 13 years until our uh, 
former chief executive passed away and I've been acting for the past year. So, so about Port Everglades, just a little bit. I think Ellen's going to try to put some slide up on the uh, screen so you don't have to stare at my face. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're critical to the local economy. Most people, you know, pre 9-11, you could drive through the port uh, to get to the beach. Uh, and people saw the port from that perspective, but because of security and various other things, the port essentially has been closed since then. But uh, we've got significant business lines that have a direct impact on the economy here in South Florida, not just uh, Broward County and not just Fort Lauderdale. Uh, as, as the slide says, we're consistently one of the uh, top three cruise ports in the entire world. Uh, almost four million people pass through the port every year. Uh, to go on a cruise. Uh, all the cargo, much of the cargo that comes into South Florida comes through Port Everglades and, uh, and we're one of the leading uh, container ports. And uh, the fuel that is in your car, uh, most people don't realize that over a third of the entire fuel supply, transportation fuels for the state of Florida are actually stored here at Port Everglades. Another reason for security. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit about the port. Uh, what's that mean for the regional economy? It's, it's about jobs, as we say. It's all about jobs. So once again, up on your screen, some statistics there. Uh, we focus on the over 13,000 jobs here. We only have, uh, as a landlord port and as a uh, Department of Broward County government, we only have about 250 uh, positions on our payroll. Uh, but there's 13,000 jobs in the entire region that are tied to Port Everglades, both on the cargo side as well as the cruise side. And as you can see on the slide, it brings a lot of economic activity to the region. So, so that we look at ourselves as a regional economic engine. So that's, that's a quick overview of the port. We're going to talk a lot more about it. But more importantly, I want to get to the other great people on our staff. We're going to tell, tell you their stories. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks, Glenn. So now I'd like to introduce Peg Buchan. She is our assistant port director and one of her specialties and, and something that she's near and dear, is, um, well, it's near and dear to her heart is our art projects and our cultural environmental projects here at the port. So Peg, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to come to this passion. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm an assistant port director here at Port Everglades. And how I got here is not possibly a normal path. My first job out of college was as a flight attendant. And from there, I went into hospitality. From there, I went into managing properties and operations. And that's how I came to the county. As Ellen said, uh, one of the things that I have enjoyed the most here in my position at the county is uh, the art that I have been able to facilitate putting into cruise terminals on roadways, paintings on the sides of buildings and garages. One of the things that's important, and this is a chihuly that you're looking at, this is blown glass. This is inside one of our cruise terminals. Um, we see public art as a welcome mat. We want our visitors to have a softer side um, viewpoint of the port. When you drive into the port, you see lots of petroleum and cement silos and um, containers, and it's, it's got an edge to it that's very industrial. So it's been a great deal of fun to take the edge off of that industrial feeling and provide this welcome mat for our 4 million uh, visitors and the, 11, the 1,300 people that, 13,000 people that work here at the port. So you're viewing some of the various ways that we've integrated art into our facilities. And uh, you can see they're all very beautiful, different, and um, they certainly do create a buzz here at the port, which is um, positive and uh, causes memories and photographs to be taken here at Port Everglades, which our visitors share with their friends and family when they return home. So that's been, very, that's been a very fun part of my job. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks, Peg. 
Now I'd like to introduce Harris Hammond. He's the Assistant Director for uh, Seaport Engineering and Facilities Maintenance, and he oversees a lot of the construction projects here at the port and makes sure that everything is, you know, um, ship shape for us. Harris? Oh, Harris. Oops, Harris has left us, I think. Um, Glenn, you want to fill in for Harris here? Sure. So Harris was a critical part of our team here at the port is our uh, facilities maintenance and seaport engineering uh, division. And Harris is an assistant director within that division. He's been with us a little over a year now. Uh, a, a professional engineer, uh, licensed, and uh, oversees our projects here at the port. And, uh, you know, as Ellen said at the beginning, uh, $1.6 billion. Is that Harris is on there now? Is Harris on there? No, it doesn't sound like he like he's joined us yet. So Harris is still with us. So we're not seeing him. Harris, is your voice here? Yeah. Now go ahead, Glenn. So, so you know, Harris and his team oversee the maintenance of all the facilities we have here on the port. Uh, we have a number Is of that, trades. Can you see me? Trades persons. Oh, oh he's oh, back. He now he's there. Harris, can you hear hear us? Or? Yes, I, yes, I can. I think it was a connection issue there. But how about now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, well, you can take over because I was uh, trying to explain what you do, but you're in a much better position to do it yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate it. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Harris Hammett. I grew up in uh, uh, Miami Lakes. I went to American Senior High, uh, high school there, and then went to college after that. Um, from there, I went to Department of Transportation, worked there for about 10 years, and then a couple of cities. And then uh, I am now working here at the port for about a year and a half. And uh, what we do, as uh, Glenn was mentioning, uh, we oversee, uh, uh, there's a, a $1.5 billion capital program, uh, the Department of Seaport um, Engineering and Facilities Maintenance um, is broken up into two divisions. One is, uh, are the folks that oversee the capital program. We actually build all of the infrastructure. And when I uh, say infrastructure, what that means is all of your, all of your buildings, uh, all of your terminals and uh, all of the um, all of the roadways, uh, including all of the water and sewer pipes and things that you can't see that are buried underneath the roads. So uh, we average approximately $100 million a year. Uh, right now we've got a couple of uh, uh, very large projects going on. Uh, one of them is a turning notch project, about half a billion dollars. Uh, if you were to do the math in that, uh, you're looking at draws of about $10 million a month. So. It's a lot of work. Uh, basically, what that is is we're enlarging the, uh, the birth capacity, and uh, in short, what that means is uh, we're taking away about three million uh, cubic yards of dirt. Uh, just to put that in in perspective, uh, that's about uh, um, almost two hundred thousand uh, dump trucks worth of soil. So, if you can just imagine how much soil we're removing, so uh, that's just one of our projects. Uh, we also uh, oversee a lot of the um, uh, the environmental issues sometimes that happen out there with the, with each of these projects. Uh, so um, we have uh, programs uh, such as relocating um, a lot of the corals and creating artificial reefs uh, that become part of the project. Um, also, uh, we oversee uh, uh, maintenance. Once we build all of these uh, projects, we actually maintain them. And uh, as far as the maintenance goes, um, uh, there are electrical components, mechanical components, uh, and uh, plumbing, uh, as well as structural. So uh, we, each of those represents a trade, and uh, we have approximately um, 100 people in our in our division uh, that are, helps us oversee all of that. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Ellen. Hi, thank you, Harris. And so now um, I'd like to introduce you to Anna Silva, who is our Acting Assistant Director of Operations. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she oversees the safety of operations. She's looking out for all of our crews and cargo operations. And she'll tell you a little bit more about that. Anna? Hi, Ellen. And hello, everybody out there in Zoom land. Um, so operations is responsible for the safe and efficient of movement of, through the port, be that ships, trucks, uh, cargo, and cruise ship passengers. 
Um, like Glenn said, there's 250 employees uh, in the port. And for the people who work under operations, we're a 24 seven operation. Um, so for the Harbor Master section like Andy, who's gonna speak later, or the crane section like Ted, um, we, we work around the clock every day, Christmas Eve, 4th of July, 3 a.m., 9 p.m. Uh, operations is moving 24 seven to, to, keep, to keep the port moving. Um, where I came from, uh, not really a career ladder, more like a jungle gym. I've been, uh, this weekend, I've actually been working in the port for 16 years. I started um, uh, with Dole Fresh Fruit and kind of moved around from there. I've done container terminal work. I've done stevedoring. I've been a ship's agent. Um, and then last year, I came to work for the port itself. Uh, this is kind of a little bit of everything in mine. Uh, some of the old tugboats I used to sail on as a, a mate. Um, I've been an instructor. I've done presentations for um, college kids and for high school children. Um, I have visited banana farms in Costa Rica with Dole. That was an excellent trip. I've been through the Panama Canal on a, on a tugboat. Um, and I've done stevedoring for cargo ships and for cruise ships. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a little bit of, I've done a little bit of everything. Um, what else? Uh, what do we do? Um, so my division helps out by, by moving the ships in and out, which brings the goods in and out. Um, which, so it could be bananas or petroleum, um, or it can be cruise passengers. So that brings tourism dollars in and out. Um, and this slide I took one day and it kind of sums up my resume. Like if a picture is worth a thousand words, this is my resume. There's a tugboat, a dole ship, a carnival ship, because I worked for them for a little bit, and the dock, because I've worked on the dock. Um, and I just, I like this. I usually post it once a year on my LinkedIn page. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's, that's operations in a nutshell, and that's me in a nutshell. We and it tell us about your education, because I think that's um, interesting too. Sure. I went to a regular old public high school in New Jersey, and then I moved on to um, New York Maritime College, where I studied engineering, and I got my uh, third mate's license to the Coast Guard, and after that, I went on to sail. Um, so I went sailing, and then I moved on, and I also went back to school and got my master's in international transportation, uh, and I've just kind of kept going with education here and there. Um, because there's always something new happening and there's always something new to learn. Uh, 3D printing is really big now. Uh, in ports in Europe, they're 3D printing propellers um, and they have smart ports where the port is all connected um, through the internet of things. So it's always good to keep going back to school and uh, picking up what's new. Thank you so much. Welcome. So now Andy Niemes, he's a duty harbor master, and he will tell you a little bit about his job and how he got there and what he does every day. Andy? Thank you, Ellen. Um, my name is Andy, and I'm a duty harbor master at Port Everglades. Um, part of my job duties would be uh, to coordinate, communicate, and supervise, supervise the on-site movement of all vessels uh, transit in the port or using the port facilities. Uh, some of the things that I do day to day would be uh, we arrange uh, harbor pilots, we call out tugboats, we arrange law enforcement, and uh, anything really uh, to get the ship in safely. There's a lot of things that we take a look at uh, prior to bringing a, sh a ship in, whether it be uh, their draft, their length, their beam. Uh, so we take a lot of things into account. It's a lot of moving parts, but uh, that's what our job is uh, to ensure that uh, it all goes well and it all uh, goes down efficiently. Um, how I got to where I'm at, uh, I pretty much after high school, I joined the Coast Guard, uh, kind of like Glenn, and uh, I did my four-year enlistment there. Uh, that's where I, I learned a lot, um, hands-on training, um, education-wise. Uh, after my four-year enlistment in the Coast Guard, I got my associate's degree uh, right here in Broward, and uh, now I'm here at Port Everglades. Uh, coordinating the traffic. So um, that's pretty much uh, what we do on the Harbor Master side. And um, I, I really enjoy it. And that's so Andy, I don't know if you can see the screen, but we're showing <clears throat> the picture of the crow's nest and, and where your office is. Yes. And can you see that? So yes. the students, he, Andy's all the way up at the top um, in that round section. Correct. So we're, we're up top in a tower. Uh, if you want to kind of compare it to, a, to an air traffic controller, I like to use that uh, 
that comparison sometimes. Uh, we are up in the tower. We got we have a good sight of uh, everything that's transit in the port, all the movements. So we got a good uh, bird's eye view up there, sort of say. Uh, and then the other photo on the right hand side, uh, that's some of our monitors. We uh, we have uh, many systems uh, like an AIS system, which is essentially uh, it tracks the vessels live, real time. That helps us in you know, uh, dealing with the estimated times of arrival and, you know, calculating are the vessels going to make it to the port in time and how all that's going to fit into the traffic. So that's kind of the stuff that we have up there. Right. Are you in the tower right now? Negative, but I would have loved to have been. It's probably too noisy in there. Too many, too many okay. radios and phones. And, and Anna, are you in your office, which is what, one floor below? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're uh, one floor below them, and I am in the office right now. And you made me shut my blinds, otherwise, I have a beautiful ocean view. <laughs> yes. So, Andy's working remotely. Somebody had asked us about remote working, and, and uh, some of us are doing that right now during the coronavirus. Um, and it's, it's some adjustment, and for, for some of us, it's working out really well. And then some of our jobs, of course, a lot of the maintenance, the landscaping, things like that, you have to be here at the port. I mean, you just have to. And uh, so we're, we're trying to balance it all out and, and we're learning just like the rest of the world. All right. So next up is uh, Ken Laban. He is our cruise services manager. So he works with all of our cruise lines and he's got an exciting job. It's Probably not as glamorous as you're thinking right now, right, Ken? So you want to tell us a little bit about that? Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's nice to be here. Um, tell you a little bit about myself. Right out of high school, I worked as the general manager for a small company that manufactured components for alarm systems. Uh, when the owner of that company sold and invested in a sports bar, I went with him and managed that bar for about three years. And that's when my work in customer service began. I really got a taste for dealing with people, all kinds of people and interesting situations. From there, I worked uh, with Carnival Cruise Lines in various capacities where I crossed paths with Anna quite a bit. Um, I worked at various capacities there, starting in guest relations and ending my 12 years there as an assistant manager of embarkation services. Pretty much seeing, overseeing every aspect of the embarkation operation while the ship was at the port and in the terminal, getting the passengers on and off the ship. That was an exciting time. Uh, I, during that time, I worked in 25 different terminals in 12 ports in five countries, including six terminals here at Port Everglades. And uh, 10 years ago now, I'm in my 10th year here at Port Everglades, and it's equally as exciting. So, Cruise services manager, there's three of us here at Port Everglades and we're all part of the business development team. Like Ellen mentioned earlier, we're here to help grow and facilitate our customers' business. So as such, there's no such thing with our job as a typical day. Uh, one day I could be in a suit on the floor of a trade show. The next day in jeans directing traffic or moving chairs or responding to some crisis. Pretty much the cruise team here, uh, myself and Karen and Kim, my teammates, are facilitators, liaisons. We're the port of the point of contact between the port and the cruise lines that are and their contractors who use our facilities. We're basically the grease in a big machine that is a cruise ship operation. On a daily basis, we have contact uh, with not only the port staff but and the cruise lines with the various government agencies like uh, the Broward Sheriff's Office and Customs and Border Protection, Coast Guard, Fire Rescue, and the transportation providers who are all essential part of the pro uh, process. And we're just here to kind of work together with them and make sure that everything runs smoothly. And uh, thank you all for having me and I'll send it back to Ellen, thank you. Thanks, Ken. I'd like to now introduce um, a less glamorous part of the port, but one that you're probably most familiar <laughs> with, 
And that's on our petroleum side, and that's Neil Kachera, who is an assistant port director. So Neil? Hi, good afternoon, fellow Zoomies. I'm Neil Kachera. I'm the assistant port director responsible for petroleum, those beautiful white storage tanks that you see when you drive around Port Everglades. And like everyone else, I come from a kind of circuitous background to get to the port. Um, I grew up here in South Florida. Uh, I left for college and returned. I love the beach, the ocean, the water, um, everything maritime, which is why I looked at opportunities at the port. For some of my background, um, growing up down here and then when I left to college, my background was really in uh, technology. And uh, when I graduated from college, I founded a um, small technology company and I worked as a software developer. And I was a software developer for about 15 years uh, in a small business. There were, uh, you know, like th there were three other partners. And similar to today, um, back in the early 2000s, there was a serious economic downturn. And during that downturn, I had recently been married. I had some small children. And um, I looked and said, you know what? Small businesses, it's, it's tough to make it. Let me look at, um, at government. And I, and, and I applied for a job. I saw an advertisement online for Port Everglades. And I applied for the IT section of Port Everglades. And fortunately, um, I, I was offered the position. And people at the port took an interest in my career development and the people that I worked for. You know, when you ask, how do, how do, you, um, how do you advance and have the job opportunities that you have? The people in the county and the port really took an interest in my career. And I was able over the years to advance. And 15 years later, I'm running uh, the petroleum business line. And I worked uh, as the number two in petroleum for, for eight years. And as I said, I can really credit the, the organization for working with me to, to advance my career, my career goals and opportunities. Um, on the petroleum side, I see some questions about projects and, and what's happening. Uh, and it's exciting that the projects that I worked on in technology, their, their duration, you know, they're short term. We had uh, maybe a five year duration for some of the more exciting technology projects I worked on. I'm working right now on a project to redevelop one of the uh, main petroleum slips at Port Everglades. That redevelopment provide, is going to provide a third of the port's petroleum capability. Um, and the duration of the, the project, the lifetime, 75 years is the expected life of the new facility. Other projects that I'm involved in um, during hurricane season, when the petroleum uh, flow is constrained, I work with the oil companies, and I work with the Coast Guard, and we make sure, if you can go back to the other slide, and we make sure that um, we can get fuel out to all the communities throughout the region. So it's, it's exciting because I have an impact in the community for projects, for fuel, um, and for revenue to the port. Uh, $36 million, 20% of the port's revenue comes through petroleum. So on this slide, to show you a little bit um, of, of the impact on petroleum, uh, the petroleum business, we supply 12 counties, um, southern Florida. We bring in over 125 million barrels of petroleum. Um, and I like to say we need a shipload of fuel, one tanker a day, to provide all of the petroleum needs here in South Florida. We provide fuel for four international airports, West Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, and out to Fort Myers. If you're in um, Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County and you went to fuel your, your car sometime this month, this year, all of the gasoline came in through Port Everglades. All of the diesel fuel for this area came in through Port Everglades. It's a very significant operation. And as Alan said, it may not be glamorous if you look at this photo, look sexy to me, not everybody else, but it's a very significant in terms of jobs, in terms of revenue, and in terms of keeping the economy going. Go ahead, next slide. This is our service area. So the area in the red, we provide 100% of the transportation fuel for that area in the red. And then we split the fuel supply with Tampa and uh, Jacksonville, Cape, uh, Port Canaveral and Orlando for the areas in the blue. Uh, in terms of innovation, um, innovation in, in the county employment, because we're, we're maritime, but we're also, we're a landlord. So for innovation, um, during, during the COVID, telecommuting has been a significant innovation. A, a lot of us are adjusting to, to working out of the office. 
Um, I had a home office for a number of years. Um, so the technology that, that we've been provided and the ability to, to work remotely just as if we're at our desks has, has been um, very innovative. From technology and the industry and the oil industry, artificial intelligence is very significant. The use of artificial intelligence to inspect pipelines for, for analysis, for failure analysis, artificial intelligence in, in geology to look at oil reservoirs. So again, from my IT background, I see that technology as being, as being very innovative. Um, we're, we do a lot in terms of the environment, our projects, we're working with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection on, on, on the environment, on the petroleum side. So there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of projects, a lot of innovation, a lot of excitement that we're working on. Um, I'm looking at the questions here, and I think I've touched on each of them. Thanks, Ellen. Good job. Okay, thanks, Neil. Um, so Robert Barcelo is, is our next speaker, and he <laughs> and he's uh, very much of an international guy. He uh, is going to talk to you about the the cargo that comes in and and how it gets here and what he does and and how it gets into the stores. Robert. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, hope everyone's doing well out there in Zoomland. Uh, a little bit about myself. I grew up in uh, Carroll City, uh, modern day uh, Miami Gardens. Uh, went to Carroll City Senior High at the time. Uh, went to Miami Dade College and then I went right to work. I've uh, been, uh, spent 40 years in the maritime industry, uh, primarily working in commercial sector for various ocean carriers coming in and out of South Florida. I joined Port Everglades back in uh, June, actually June 10th. Uh, six years ago, uh, and uh, been loving it ever since. Uh, my job, in a nutshell, is to go out and promote the port's facilities uh, from a cargo side, uh, containerized cargo, uh, all throughout uh, primarily Latin America. Uh, we are uh, about 75% of what we carry, what comes in and out of the port, uh, comes to and from Latin America. Uh, Caribbean, Central America, South America, both East and West Coast. Uh, it doesn't stop there. We get cargo from Europe, Asia, essentially all around. Um, again, promoting the port, not only to the ocean carriers, but also the different uh, port authorities uh, throughout uh, the world uh, and the region. Uh, also, uh, on a local level, speak with the uh, brokers, the shippers, the exporters, uh, just all around anyone that has anything to do with moving cargo through the port, both import and export. Uh, it, it might be it, it might be wise to say that just about everything that you get your hands on uh, comes in through the port. Uh, anything from uh, underwear through uh, oh, uh, pineapples, bananas, automobiles, uh, the Chevy Blazer that you might see in the streets of South Florida which is assembled in Mexico, uh, comes in through Port Everglades. Uh, some of the cars that we manufacture here in the U.S. are, are exported through the port. Uh, BMW SUVs are exported. The Honda CRV is exported through the port out uh, to the world. Um, and, and that's it's pretty much in a nutshell uh, what, what I do. Uh, thank you. Back to you, Ellen. Thanks, Robert. All right. Sharing. Okay, so our next speaker can talk to you about the cranes. And if any of you are boaters and have been out on on the waterways and have seen our giant cranes, you, those are nothing compared to what you're going to see. So, Ted Avachara, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Hello. My name is Ted Ocharov. I work uh, for Port Everglades in the crane section. I'm a construction project manager. I've been here for five years and I have over 27 years experience in the marine industry. I grew up, uh, I grew up in New Jersey, born and raised there, graduated high school, not sure what I wanted to do. So I went to the Associates College and got an electronics degree. Upon graduation, look for, looking for some experience, I joined the United States Air Force Reserve and spent six months in the getting trained on avionics on aircraft. Uh, after getting out of training, 
I got, a, I got a small job in an electronics firm, not satisfied with the work, went back to school and got an engineering degree. Upon graduation, elect, electrical engineering degree, upon graduation, it was one of the worst job markets. And I love Florida. An opportunity came up at Port Everglades and I took the job and went to Port Everglades. Started my career as a crane maintenance electrician right here in Port Everglades when I was 27 years old, working on, on the first three cranes that arrived here in 1992. And over the past 27 years, spent eight years in Florida, moved back to New Jersey, spent 15 years up in the Northeast, again, working at Port Elizabeth, Port of Bayonne, and finally growing tired of the cold, decided uh, I'd like to get back to Florida. Had an opportunity, came back down here, and then, hence I'm right back where I started 27 years ago, working as a construction project manager on the cranes. Uh, my day-to-day -day operations here is, Essentially, working on working on projects, new and old, upgrading upgrading cranes, uh, assisting the crane personnel with uh, technical troubleshooting or technical assistance, calling in vendors and to the like, ordering parts and material, keep parts moving. Uh, I would say, if you're interested in, in getting into this type of career path, uh, you want to be definitely want to be a hands-on person, be able to enjoy working indoors and outdoors. It is a 24-7 operation. Be flexible with your time. Yeah. Be able to have time management in your career. And if any career ladders is, is in high school, stay with vocational school, take a technical training course or technical school, um, get in the construction field, get hands-on, and be willing to work hard and long hours. And it's enjoyable, and I enjoy it. Ed, could you tell us a little bit about the cranes that we have now and what's coming in the future? Uh, the cranes we have now were manufactured around 1992 to 97. There's seven cranes. They're low profile, low profile cranes. One of the reasons they are low profile is because of proximity to the airport. They have to maintain a low, low uh, air, air draft or air restriction height for the aircraft coming in. Therefore, they're, it's called a, a shuttle boom. If you see the style of the the boom is the uh, horizontal member that goes in and out over the ship. Instead of vertical, it's horizontal to keep the profile of the crane low. Uh, the new cranes coming in are going to be taller, faster, and quicker cranes. Their uh, lift height will be about 130 feet off the ground. The existing are only 100. So it'll be about 30 foot more lift. The, the boom will be able to reach over 22 foot wide container ship. The boom itself is over 400 foot long. Yeah, they're huge cranes, they operate very fast, they're semi-automatic, and potentially down the road, there's the opportunity to have these cranes manless and operate from remote locations, which would be an exciting project to work on. Thanks, Ted. And so I think I should point out that it, they could be just staffless, not just manless. <laughs> so, because we have some women crane operators as well. Um, all right, so our, our final speaker is one that's going to talk to you about the future and what Port Everglades is going to look like. And I'm happy to introduce Dr. Natasha Yusena. Natasha, you need to unmute. There you go. Thank you, Ellen. All right, good afternoon, Zoomers. Good afternoon, students. Thank you um, for all my colleagues here. Uh, our CEO to Fabi for uh, coordinating this. Um, great, great opportunity. So I'm Dr. Natasha Yassens. I am the Seaport Planning Manager at the Port. And a little bit about myself, I am originally from Haiti. I came to this country when I was nine years old. Um, spent most of my life in Little Havana and also um, Aventura. So it was a combination. We went from Little Havana to Aventura. Uh, right after high school, I uh, went to Miami Dade College where I was pretty much trying to figure out um, you know, what I wanted to do with myself. I, I know I want to do something with environmental or infrastructure development, but I wasn't quite sure what it was called. So, so my guidance counselor, and I said, you know what, I think you want to do, you want to be a geologist. So my first semester at Miami Dade College, I actually took and learned about rocks and so forth, but I knew that I think that wasn't what it was. So eventually I was, I was led into, um, you know, understanding what planning was. So I have the bachelor's in um, Public Administration and International Relations. Then I transferred to FIU where I got my master's in environmental and urban systems from College of Engineering at FIU. And then I transferred to FAU where I finished up with the PhD 
and public administration with a, with a concentration in public policy. So I've been with the port for the past 12 years, um, but also I, um, in terms of career-wise, I was the uh, planning director with one of the cities of Miami-Dade County. Uh, I also spent three years as an assistant to a city manager for, um, for a city of Miami-Dade County. And prior to me coming to the um, Port Everglades, I was uh, an adjunct professor and also a transportation director of planning for one of the uh, a consulting firm. So how did I enter into mar maritime planning? Because I had done land use planning and also um, what's known as the long range planning, comprehensive planning. I saw the position opened up uh, at the time it was a principal planner position. And I said, you know what, planning is a process. So planning in itself is a process and it's both reactive as well as um, proactive. But what I'm finding myself as the um, Seaport planning manager, myself and my team is that we facilitate decision-making for preset vision, mission, and also um, objectives set either by our CEO and or the Board of County Commissioners. So we ensure those preset policies or vision and mission and objectives are met. So facilitate how they arrive at those decisions. So one of the things that I do is, um, among other things, we have an economic impact um, contract that we have with the consultant that I ensure that uh, we get the services. For example, um, looking at some of the regional and economic uh, for all our business line at the port, whether it's cargo and cruise, what has been the impact from a regional perspective for jobs and so forth um, on a yearly basis. My division, my section does a lot of uh, contract and project management. So as far as a typical day, we don't really have it. I can come into the office and uh, I'm looking at a traffic analysis. So we have agreements with the FDOT to collect traffic. So at the end of the day, when we get those information, how do we um, look in terms of traffic uh, for that particular time period? I also lead the master vision plan. So looking at our port, again, on the vision side, as far as the um, planning, what is the future of the port uh, when they look like? So a lot of interfacing. Uh, the crane division spoke about uh, FAA, uh, when Ted spoke to you about the FAA, because of the fact that we are near the airport. So my section also interfaces with the airport in terms of finding out where we can locate the, the cranes that are upcoming um, and expected to be at the port in the fall. So work on that. We also work as an example with our assistant directors of, um, at the port, whether it's pegged with Neo as far as petroleum uh, and looking at the, uh, the impact and also the, um, the options or the decision or the choices that um, for future of the port that the tenant and the other stakeholders would like to see. So we do a lot of charrettes as part of the master plan updates. Um, we also do a lot of interfacing with seaport construction. So we plan and before it gets constructed and developed, we also do the plan. So my team and I, this is what we do at the port. We have about $3 billion worth of projects that are anticipated um, um, for the next 20 years. Whether or not all those projects are gonna happen, that's a different story because again, you know, it's seeming, seemingly what's happening with the pandemic. Um, but we do plan uh, every two to three years because of that. My, my section also looks at a, uh, the market forecast. As you know, we have three, four specific business lines. We have non-containerized, we have containerized, we have petroleum as well as the cruise. So as far as planning, we look at what is the market saying uh, for those business lines for the future. So as part of the master plan update, we look to see what is um, happening from an international as well as a regional and national perspective to see whether or not, if we are proposing as an example to expand the terminal, is this a good time to do it? If we are proposing as an example to widen the road or to um, try and see whether or not there is need for new facilities at the port, it doesn't just happen, it has to happen based on planning. So I like to say that our particular section, myself and my team, we facilitate the decision, but not just the planning and the development, but also where those resources should be, um, should be applied. So as well as coordinating with, um, with all the divisions. We work with uh, Ellen's division, uh, business development as far as when it comes to um, outreach meetings that we have, so Ellen's division assists us. There's a lot of interfacing with planning. So this particular career, I would say, is you have to have thick skin, but you also have to be extremely adaptable and adjustable. You have to be able to um, understand that things will happen. And um, as an example, with the pandemic going on right now, we have to replan some of the things that we have already allocated. We have to consider to see whether or not we want to move forward with those projects. So again, that's all part of planning. We also do a lot of interfacing. We have a people mover uh, rail project. So we work with our rail division down at the transportation uh, department to see whether or not that even is, is feasible. And where those rails gonna be? If it's gonna be a rail to accommodate the cruise lines, 
the cruise passengers, is it gonna be going from the airport to the seaport and the convention center? So there's a lot of interfacing that we do as part of my job. Um, I would have to say, I want you all to always consider why you're doing what you're doing. It's very important to do that. You have to ask yourself, why am I in this career? Uh, we're not saying that it shouldn't be just for, it shouldn't be for money, but let money not be the only factor. But uh, to have fun, have fun. There's gonna be days where you have to um, read. For those of you who don't like to read, my, in, the, in the planning field, you have to enjoy reading, research, uh, statistics, analysis, and also working with people, very key, because you're gonna have different individuals and know your area, know the federal, um, something about the federal, what's happening with the federal government, state government, as well as the local government, and to some extent also international, so very key. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Ellen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, we're going to be in front of the board on June 16th. Um, so it's going to be really exciting. So stay tuned if, if you care to watch the uh, Broward County Board of County Commissioners meeting, June 16th, hot day for us. Yeah, for us to adopt the master vision plan. Right, right. <laughs> so um, I'm going to look at some of these questions and answers. Um, we, uh, what is the newest improvement project or port part of the port? And I think Dr. Yusenet, um touched on some of those and so did Ted when we were talking about um, the cranes. Um, Neil in our petroleum talked about our slip improvements. And so those are some of the, the newest things that are happening right now, and, and of course, our Southport turning notch extension, which will allow us to have five more ships or up to five more ships at the berth. So right now, um, the berth is 900 feet, and we're gonna add another 1,500 feet to it. So it's going to be uh, much larger, and that's where the new cranes are going, and it's uh, probably our largest single project in the port's history, so that's a big deal. Um, how has the coronavirus affected our uh, company culture? Okay, well, um, I'll take that one too. So in, in our port, we have a lot of people who are um, administrative people, so they, they can work in, uh, remotely if that works for them. Um, and we are about half staff, uh, a third of our staff are working remotely, and half of them are in one day and half of them are in the next day and they're teleworking from home. So um, it's an interesting question because some of us love it and some of us don't. And I think from a creativity standpoint, um, it's nice to have that human interaction and we miss that. But from a get it done standpoint, I know that it's better for me to do my writing and that kind of thing at home. Anybody else wanna chime in? Well, Ellen, uh, I mean, I'm home right now. So it's, it's nice to have the flexibility but yeah. as you mentioned before, you know, the, the, the interfacing is something that's lacking. But it is something, again, you know, planning being, a, you know, reactive as well as, you know, proactive. Things happen and you just have to prepare for it and, you know, be adaptable. Okay. And um, we have the question. Oh, does somebody else want to chime in? Sorry. Um, one other question is, what's our favorite part about working for the port? Um, I can tell you from my standpoint, every day is different. I like that. Um, I'm a little bit of a ping pong ball. Um, one day I can be working on a, a big project, looking at contracts uh, and trying to figure out, you know, what a cruise line needs in order to, you know, get restarted with business. And that goes back to the uh, coronavirus question. And another day, you know, I'll be working on something and all of a sudden some hot topic comes up with the media and I'm answering a reporter's questions. So my day is always different. Um, I think, Glenn, how, how, do you, how would you like to answer that? Well, I think, you know, from my perspective, uh, it's, it's really the people that we get to inter, interface with on a day-to-day -day basis. As Ellen said, uh, you know, I, I always come in with a list of things that I'm gonna work on, and at the end of the day, I probably, in many cases, have that same list but it's the people that we get to uh, engage with, you know, whether they're local, the government, private sector people, uh, whether they're from different ports around the country or around the world, uh, because, you know, we're, we try to learn from others. You know, it, it's, uh, 
in my Coast Guard day, I used to say, what is experience? Experience is learning what not to do the next time. And we've got had a lot of those experiences here at Port Everglades. And, and, uh, but the opportunity to learn from others, you know, because there's a wealth of knowledge out there throughout the world about ports and about uh, business activity. So that's, that's my favorite part is actually uh, meeting new people and learning new things on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, thank you. Ted, this question's for you. We're being asked, um, what are we gonna do with the old cranes? And don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, currently we have uh, seven older Samsung cranes. The, like I had mentioned before, they're from 1992 and older drive systems. When the new three, three new cranes come to Port Everglades and are online, which means they're working, functioning, they're gonna one by one, each, each crane is gonna come offline for about six months and be upgraded. The current drive systems or the control systems for the hoist, gantry, trolley, booming function are all DC controls. It's gonna be upgraded to AC controls, a PLC, programmable logic controller is gonna be upgraded and every motor is gonna be changed out uh, to put maybe 10 to 20 more years of life into these cranes. Okay, thank you. Um, we're being asked about, um, I'm gonna skip around a little bit, um, about uh, the deepening project. Glenn, I think this is you again and how the environment will be affected and uh, the coral reefs. Oh yeah, okay, Alan, thanks. And you, you probably saw it on that video at the beginning. You know, we've, we've had a, a project that's been in the works now for, was it 24 years? 24 years uh, to deepen Port Everglades. You know, the ships keep getting larger. That one slide that showed what can go through the Panama Canal today compared to what uh, went through there uh, five years ago. So to remain competitive in the world market, we have to deepen and widen our channels. But uh, the environment is a key part of that. Uh, the coral reefs that are offshore are critical to not just the economy here in uh, South Florida, but are, are pretty critical to the environment. So part of that project is actually to invest in uh, offshore reefs uh, growing Coral, over 100,000 corals will actually be grown in a nursery and planted out on artificial reefs offshore. Seagrasses uh, will be grown uh, south of the port. There's an area called Westlake Park. We'll be doing a number of improvements in there as well as part of the mitigation of the impacts. And during the project itself, we'll be spending a lot of time and a lot of money on ensuring that there is no impact during the construction itself, that the uh, the, the sediment that's stirred up when the dredging and you think about dig, digging and when you're at the beach and you dig in the sand and you all that sand that gets stirred up. Well, the same thing occurs. So uh, we've been doing a lot of research, sort of breaking new ground in a sense of what can we done from a technology standpoint to minimize the impact of, to the surrounding area. And that, that's been our real focus on that. And it's a significant part of the cost of the project. Okay, don't unmute yourself. Glenn, you get the next question too, which is, <laughs> well, I, I would take a stab at this, but I think it's better no for you. Um, with the cruise industry shut down, like most other industries, did it cause any furloughs at the port? Okay, now it's a good, good question. And I think one of the things that the, uh, the county administrator, the county commission said is, do our best to keep people employed. You know, as we know, there's a lot of people who have been furloughed off of jobs throughout South Florida, but our focus was keeping people employed. Uh, we're an enterprise fund, which means we don't get any local tax dollars. So we have to operate based on uh, the amount of money we generated to pour. And to give you an example, uh, last month in April, uh, looking at last year, we earned uh, over $16 million of revenue. Uh, this past year, month, uh, we only earned $9 million. So that's a big hit in our budget. Uh, but uh, we look at cutting expenses, uh, deferring projects that could be deferred. So, But our ultimate goal was, no, no, let's keep people on the payroll. They might be doing different things, uh, but even an empty cruise terminal needs maintenance. Normally over the summer, we do a lot of maintenance. So we're taking the opportunity to do that maintenance now. So 
uh, at least as of today, uh, no furloughs here at Port Everglades for the Port Everglades Department. Okay, and I'm gonna let each one of our panelists ask this last question. We've had a few of them and I'll start. Um, that we're being asked what our greatest challenge is and, and mine really is keeping up with my emails. Um, but I think really it's to get the name of the port out there. Port Everglades does not reflect where we are in Broward County, um, in Greater Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood. Um, we cannot change the name of the port because, um, well, it's legally Port Everglades and it's in all the navigational charts and everything else, but we can't say that we're in Fort Lauderdale because only about 20% of the port is in Fort Lauderdale and the, the remainder is in a little bit in Dania Beach, another uh, percentage, and, and the majority is in the city of Hollywood. So we are made up of those three cities and uh, you know, at some point I imagine that we were in the Everglades and are considered in the Everglades. So help us get the word out. That would be uh, making my job a little less challenging. Neil? I think the, um, the the biggest challenge is on on the petroleum side is balancing the um, the competing interests. Uh, I coordinate with a dozen different oil terminals. Um, I coordinate with the county, with state um, government, with federal government, and and everyone has a different priority. And it's a matter of of, of getting the best the best solution. We want to maximize the benefits of moving fuel efficiently and safely into South Florida and we want to minimize any of the adverse impacts. Okay, Peg? One of the most important things to me is getting things done uh, on a legislative uh, platform, either the county, the state, the federal. And in order to do that, people really need to understand what Port Everglades is and who Port Everglades is and what we do. To that end, I am very grateful to many of the people that you're looking at on the panel. Uh, Natasha, for instance, is uh, serves on the board of directors for the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce. Anna is a is the, the either the current or the past president of Women in Shipping. Ellen, you've been extremely involved with the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, Glenn sits on too many uh, boards and uh, committees than I could name. All of these inroads into the port uh, by people who would not normally understand what the port does helps me in my challenge to um, do things on a legislative basis that will benefit the port. Thank you. Thanks. Robert? The challenge, uh, you, you touched on it, uh, getting the word out, uh, especially during these days of uh, social distancing, no travel, uh, just staying put. Uh, using all the different platforms as, has become a way of uh, supplementing how we get the word out, uh, showing uh, the community, the shipping public at large, what we offer here at Port Everglades in comparison to other ports, uh, not only in Florida, but in the entire Atlantic coast. Uh, we compete uh, with, in Florida alone, we compete with about other four or five ports that have similar size and hours. So the challenge is to constantly uh, be out there, uh, reminding the, the public and, and the shipping uh, interest what Port Everglades is and, and what we do best in moving their cargo in and out of the port. Thanks, Robert. Glenn? Oh, you got it. Yeah, there you go. I got it. I'm, I'm unmuted. Well, well, thanks, Ellen. And, and uh, thank you for those who have joined us today. It's, uh, you know, one of the challenges uh, it's all about balancing, you know, and I think, you know, when you, you sit there, you're in high school, you're trying to decide what you want to do going forward. It's the same kind of balance has to occur as, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up, so to speak? Uh, but we're here and we have a great team here at the port, but it's a balance. It's a balance between those environmental uh, impacts of the things that we do. It's the economic impacts of the things that we do for the region, all of those jobs that are created uh, by the port. And, you know, and finally, it's engaging with the community. And it's finding that right balance, which is really what we do and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is trying to make decisions, taking all factors into account. Just, just don't say, well, 
this is the answer and that's the way it is. This is you know, and you can do that. I think that applies to life as well. Is so make sure you listen to all points of view before you make a decision about anything going forward. So that's my story. Okay. Ken? Hi again. So uh, the the port, the staff here at the port and the cruise lines that we work with and their contractors are all very professional. And on a normal operation, we could have eight ships debarking at the same time. And it's like a dance. It all goes very smoothly. The challenge comes when something unusual happens. When we have something as simple as a, a ship coming in late or something as major as a hurricane coming or a virus outbreak on board. That's when the job gets really challenging. And it also is when it gets really exciting. It's really my favorite. Quiet! So yeah, that's all, that's all. All right, Andy. Okay, as far as uh, challenging, um, I'd like to say that almost every day is challenging. I see every day as a, as a puzzle. Um, with the steady traffic flow, it's, it's always like a little game to where we just got to fit each ship into each time slot so that everything goes efficiently. And, um, and we work hard at doing that. And like I said earlier, there's a lot of moving parts to uh, these ships arriving and departing. So uh, every day is challenging, really. So, uh, but like Ken said, I mean, when we get, uh, you know, unexpected things, uh, you know, delayed vessels or hurricanes or something of that nature, I mean, that just takes our whole job to the next level. And now we're uh, really, you know, crunching numbers, times, and really trying to just make it uh, all work together so that we could uh, efficiently move the vessels. Thank you. Anna? It's not really an original thought because everybody's kind of already said this, but um, the biggest challenge is both managing and balancing expectations from our tenants. Uh, we have five cruise lines with multiple ships and I've only got eight terminals. So sometimes, sometimes it's a little bit of a referee game, like who wins and who loses, who gets what they want and who doesn't. Uh, the same thing for cargo and ships down in Southport and Midport. We only have a set number of berths and if all of our tenants wanna bring in their ships all at the same time, especially for like before a holiday or right after a holiday to catch up the schedule, it's, it's a lot of but managing expectations and refereeing. Thanks. How about you, Ted? What's challenging? I'd have to say, uh, in, in this position, is staying up with all the latest technology. Uh, one of the reasons these older cranes are getting upgraded is because most of the components are obsolete. But in the meantime, when the, these components fail, they're part of our uh, job requirements, go out and find something suitable that will fit and work and keep these cranes running. And I would say that's the most challenging part here is just staying up to date with the technology. Thank you. Natasha? I would have to say, Ellen, two things. One is uh, part of my role is to present to a group, um, to um, stakeholders, so presentation sometimes is a challenge. Uh, and I say that because some of the time the information, you have to be very careful how you craft the information and deliver it. And the second challenge is confidentiality. That's very key because you're gonna be providing, as part of the master plan, we were able to get information from you know, competing tenants. So you have to be able to know, you know what to say and when to say it and who to say it to. So then it sometimes can become a challenge. But again, those are the kind of skills that you have to, you know, to make sure that you have if you wanna go into the plan. Yeah. Thank you. Harris? Uh, thank you. Yeah, one of the challenges, um, we work uh, with the construction industry and um, one of the issues they are having is uh, there is a real shortage of uh, trades uh, people uh, that are needed uh, to build uh, infrastructure, as we were talking about before, um, whether it's folks that build electrical components of a building or ACs, plumbing, any one of the trades, steel work, that kind of stuff. Um, there's a real sor shortage right now. A lot of folks did not go into those professions and so the contractors are, are really um, looking for the, uh, the, that kind of expertise. So it's good news for if you're in high school right now and you, you like working in the field, like the construction industry, uh, it is a good uh, profession to get into. Uh, there's various ways to get into it. Uh, you can combine those trades uh, with some engineering background as well. And uh, 
and you'll have a, a job waiting for you. So if you keep up with those uh, kind of requirements and uh, keep just keep Googling those kind of those trades, it'll give you the numbers of exactly who's hiring. Uh, something to keep in mind. So those are some of the challenges right now in the construction industry and uh, something that we're working through, but it's good news for, for people that are just coming up into their profession right now. Thank you. Bobby, thank you so much for, for putting this together for us. And I want to thank uh, Macy Alpert, who's in the background here, reminding me to switch screens and mute and unmute. Um, and all of my coworkers, I think I learned a little bit about each one of you today. And uh, students, most of all, we really appreciate you listening in. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and YouTube, and LinkedIn. And um, that was Macy. Um, <laughs> and so thank you again, and happy Maritime Day. And uh, hopefully we get to meet you in person next yeah. year. Thank you. So thank you so much, Ellen and Maisie, and all of you for speaking, and the students as well. Students, um, <laughs> once you watched, you have been entered for the gift card giveaway, so I will be emailing the winners for that. And before we go, we have a brief announcement from Martha Rios about the JA Fellows Program. Martha? Hello, everybody. How are you today? I am super excited to make an announcement. As Fabi said, thank you. My name is Martha Rios. I am the Director of Entrepreneurship at Junior Achievement of South Florida. We have a program called JA Fellows Company Program where students get to create their own real small businesses from the conception of a product to the liquidation of a company. We recently had our local competition uh, on May 9th. We had the opportunity to submit our top three student companies for consideration for the national competition. And today, just a few hours ago, we um, we were informed that two of our companies are invited to the national competition. So. Without further ado, the two companies, not only one, but two, that have been invited to the national competition are Germ Genie from University School. Congratulations. And congratulations to them, yes. And the second uh, company that is also invited is Good Essence from Madrow Stoneman Douglas. Awesome. So we will be very excited to share with you uh, further news about them. And thank you very much for uh, being with us today. Thanks, Fabi, for the opportunity. No problem. Thank you. And congratulations to the two schools. Mm -hmm. yep. Bye, everybody. Bye. Have a good weekend.